Hello, I'm John Foster and I'm a medical doctor who does social security disability exams. And today's video is for my medical colleagues and it's about how to diagnose functional illness. As usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions based on my own experience and study and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. I was prompted to do this video because last week I saw several magnificent examples of functional illness, several in the Social Security Disability exams and one simply driving to the store. Now, there's an extremely small literature on functional illness in medicine. The people who have written the most about it are psychiatrists. I suspect this is because physicians feel that they are harming the patient if they diagnose them with functional illness. And even psychiatrists are afraid to make the correct diagnosis at times. The best example is their absolute refusal to diagnose psychopathic personality disorder in children and teenagers, whereas many of the parents of such patients can detect that something is seriously wrong as early as six months of age. If you want to see an excellent depiction of psychopathic personality disorder in infancy, childhood, and adolescence, I suggest you watch the movie and read the book. We need to talk about Kevin. They're both somewhat different and they're both brilliant in my opinion. I believe that these negative connotations of diagnosing a patient with functional illness are very, very wrong. I think it's an advantage to the patient if they have a functional illness to be so diagnosed for several reasons. These patients are ex at extremely high risk for iatrogenic harm. The first type of harm is over-investigation. I've seen these patients have thousands and thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of investigations and multiple consultations. The second risk is over-medication. My current record is a functional patient, a young man, who was on 26 different medications, probably only one or two of which were necessary. Once you're on 26 different medications, you are bound to suffer adverse effects. All of these medications also were paid for by the American taxpayer. The third risk is unnecessary surgery. And I would implore my surgical colleagues, if you suspect that a patient may be functional, even if you're not an expert in detecting that, refer them to a psychiatrist or psychologist for an opinion before operating and be very, very wary of operating for the indication of pain alone. I remember distinctly a patient who I saw for a social security disability exam who'd had three operations on their neck and told me they were no, not improved at all from any of the three and then described with great eagerness and delight the fourth operation that they were scheduled to have in a couple of months. When I inquired why they wanted a fourth operation when three had proved futile, they had no explanation. And the fourth problem with functional illness is that the patient may actually cause severe harm to themselves. I had one patient who had a functional illness, of a form of Munchausen syndrome, this was a man in his 20s who enjoyed being admitted to the hospital. To be admitted, he would drink water to the point of water intoxication when he would suffer symptoms from fluid overload and hyponatremia, and he'd been admitted to the hospital many times. However, one time he miscalculated and he died from excessive water drinking in his 20s. Now, as I've discussed in previous videos, there are two main groups of patients with functional illness. Functional meaning that the patient complains or demonstrates 
physical symptoms and signs that are caused by their mind, not by their body. The first is hypochondriasis. This is the person who believes that they are ill when in fact they are healthy. The second is malingering. This is the person who believes that they are healthy but deliberately pretends to be ill in order to gain some sort of advantage, often monetary or legal. A group that overlaps the two is what I call symptom exaggerators. These are patients who have physical disease or injury. Usually they're looking for money and they exaggerate the symptoms and signs of their actual disease in order to achieve their goal. It's my contention that functional illness should be a positive diagnosis. There should be positive findings of functionality in the history and or physical exam. And I believe that the physician should never make the diagnosis of functional illness with only one positive indicator. I prefer at least three and preferably more. Always be aware that a patient who has no findings on physical exam is not necessarily a functional patient. I've seen a host of patients in my 43 years in medicine with serious physical disease who had normal findings on their exam. I distinctly remember a woman in her 40s who complained of severe headache, which had been treated by a capable family doctor for a year and had multiple indicators of hysterical neurosis. I saw her in the emergency department and since I had no other patients, I did a detailed, almost medical student, neurological exam and everything was completely and utterly normal. I don't know what was my motivation, but I ordered a CT scan of her head and it showed impressive hydrocephalus and it turned out that she had a benign obstructing fourth ventricle tumor and needed neurosurgery. Things to keep in mind when the symptoms and signs don't add up and you're thinking the patient might be functional is one, is this an atypical presentation of a common disease? Two, is this a rare disease, in particular a disease I've never seen before? Or three, does the patient have two, three, or multiple physical conditions causing their confusing mix of symptoms and signs? So let's get down to the positive findings in functional illness. And I'm going to begin with the history. The first is what I call the negative greeting sign. You say, hello, Mr. Jones, how are you? And Mr. Jones replies, oh, I'm here, or I've had better days. Now, this doesn't refer to the patient who's just come in the emergency department with a broken leg. This refers to patients who are seen in the clinic or office whose problem has, is of long standing. This is not 100% accurate, but an extremely negative greeting tends to be associated with functionality, although it certainly can be associated with depression. The second is the patient complaining of conditions which they know will have no physical findings. These conditions include headache, pain in the other parts of the body, dizziness, weakness, nausea without vomiting, and of course, psychiatric problems. Functional patients know not to complain that their leg is broken because with a five minute exam and a one minute review of the x-ray, you'll know if their problem is genuine or not. The third is excessive modifiers. Modifiers are adjectives or adverbs the patient uses to describe their condition. A patient with physical disease will have, say, I have a bad headache. The patient with functional disease 
may say something like, it feels like a light bulb is exploding in my head and sending shards of light through my eyeballs. It's terrible. It's excruciating. I feel like I can't go on, etc., etc. The next is multiple complaints. Now, obviously, some people have multiple physical conditions that they complain of. But be especially aware of patients who complain of multiple conditions which cannot be demonstrated by physical exam or tests, such as headache and pain and dizziness and nausea, but nothing like a broken leg. And finally, as I've described before, I've found that if patients say that their memory and cognition are impaired and use those words, memory and cognition, it's extremely rare that they have a physical condition. Last week, I had a social security disability exam patient who told me that their memory and cognition were impaired and then proceeded to give a very long and detailed history of their medical problems, including the exact dates of all their surgeries and they had a functional condition. I had a second patient who just wasn't all there. I couldn't put my finger on it, but he had four serious medical problems, all of which could be impairing his memory and cognition. One of the things I was struck by was that he had a very serious infection in 2015 that required surgery and prolonged antibiotic treatment and he couldn't remember exactly where the infection had been and he had not been confused or comatose at that time. That's a problem with memory. The vast majority of patients with impaired cognition and or impaired memory will not volunteer information. You usually get that information from family members or friends or from what you notice in taking the history. Now on to the physical examination. And the first thing to look at is vital signs. If a patient tells you that they're having severe pain right now, the moment you're examining them, for example, they claim to have a severe incapacitating migraine, and their vital signs are normal, that's a positive finding because patients with severe pain tend to have tachycardia, tachypnea, and elevated blood pressure. A patient complaining of severe pain with a heart rate of 62 who's not on beta blockers should prick up your ears. The next positive finding may be found in the eye exam, and this is dramatic blinking squinting and grimacing while testing extraocular movements and pupillary reactions. Now, there are conditions where extraocular movements or, and or shining a light in the pupils is painful, but they should be pretty obvious. The next positive physical finding is low effort with range of motion and strength testing. In all my disability patients, I go through a screening range of motion test and more detailed range of motion if they're complaining of specific parts of their musculoskeletal system. Functional patients tend to move very slowly. I call this the moving in slow motion sign or slow motion sign. Whereas patients with a true physical impairment that's of long standing know exactly when the pain or stiffness begins. For example, the pain, patient who can only abduct their arm so high will move their arm rapidly to almost the stopping point and then slowly and then stop. The patient with a functional illness will move in slow motion throughout the range of motion, often a accomplishing a full range of motion but in slow motion. This is an example of a common phenomenon in functional patients and that they behave in the way they think an ill or injured patient would behave, but not in the way an actual ill or injured patient behaves. 
when it comes to strength testing, I find that the number one functional sign is in the strength of the legs. I examine the legs with the patient seated with the exam table high enough that their feet are off the ground, and I place my hand in front of their ankles and have them extend their knees vigorously against resistance, and then behind their ankles and have them flex their knees vigorously against resistance. Functional patients often demonstrate clasp knife weakness and often barely press their legs against my hands. And if their legs were actually that weak that they could barely exert the slightest amount of pressure, their legs would not be strong enough to bear their weight when they stood and walked. However, I've already seen these patients walk and stand in when they come into the examination room. A patient who can stand and walk normally should have at most a little bit of four out of five weakness. Another thing I observe as the patient walks into the exam room is how they sit down in the chair prior to giving their history and how they handle their belongings if they have any. A patient who's able to sit down in a chair and then bend over almost 90 degrees to place their belongings on the floor, but who during the range of motion exam barely flexes their lumbar spine when asked to do so is demonstrating an inconsistency that suggests a functional illness. Patients with functional illness often demonstrate non-anatomic, non-physiologic sensory changes on neurological exam. They'll complain of numbness or diminished sensation in patterns that do not fit any central or peripheral nervous system disease or any neuropathy. They also may demonstrate a positive finding that I call the do it again sign, where I'll run my finger along their arm or leg and ask if they feel it normally, and they'll look very pensive and say, do it again. I have never found a patient who demonstrated the do it again sign who had a physical illness. Patients who have numbness or dysesthesia due to physical illness always know if something feels normal or not. It's obvious to them. And my final positive sign is what I call the sit-up sign. This is useful in patients complaining of low back pain. I have the patient lie down supine on the examining table, and then I ask them to get up off the table and stand up. If they can sit straight up in the manner of doing a sit-up exercise, it's very unlikely that they have serious low back pain. Doing a sit-up places enormous stress on the lumbar spine. In fact, many exercise coaches caution against patients with no back problems doing sit-ups because they may cause back problems. Almost all patients with serious lumbar spine problems who need to get up from a supine position will first roll over on one side and then sit up sideways. That places much less stress on the lumbar spine. So what were the physical signs that I saw this past week? Well, the first was in a malingerer, and this person was a beggar. He was stationed at a stoplight in busy intersection, carrying a sign asking for donations. He was doing what's called the dragging leg walk. His right leg was externally rotated, and when he walked, he would drag it along the ground. There is no physical disease or injury where the patient drags their leg on the ground. It should be considered a pathologic, uh, sorry, a pathognomonic sign of functional illness. The second functional sign was in a hypochondriacal patient who had many functional signs in their history and physical. When I 
asked to check their gait and asked them to walk towards me and then walk back to the other side of the exam room. They demonstrated an exaggerated scissors gait. This is similar to a runway model gait. A runway model will place one foot directly ahead of their hind foot. However, neither foot crosses the midline. This patient would put their front foot past the midline on the side of the hind foot. It's quite difficult to do. I tried it after the patient left and almost fell down the first time I tried it. It's an example of what is known as uneconomic posturing, which is when the physician asks the patient to demonstrate something, the patient simulates difficulty but actually does something that is much more difficult than what the physician asked. Now, a crossed leg gait or scissors gait can occur in ill patients. It's seen with extreme spasticity of both lower extremities and is common in cerebral palsy. However, there should be upper motor neuron signs such as spasticity, and positive Babinski sign, and hyperactive reflexes. A patient who otherwise has a normal neurological exam of the legs and demonstrates a scissors gait is fabricating a problem. So what should you do if you encounter a functional patient in the clinic or the office? Well, the first thing I think that you should do is a careful phys physical exam. You're seeing a patient in which the history is not of much use or may even be misleading. As physicians, we're co commonly dealing with patients who are unable to, to produce a helpful history. This includes infants and children, the confused, and the comatose. I always say there are no 500-year-old hypochondriacs or malingerers. These people get ill and eventually die just like any other folks. And I think that a thorough physical exam is obligatory to rule out physical disease in functional patients. And in certain circumstances, a panel of screening tests is appropriate, and the ones I would recommend are number one, urinalysis, a test that is ordered far too infrequently by young doctors today and can provide a wealth of information at minimal cost, a complete blood count, a metabolic panel, an electrocardiogram, and a chest x-ray. You won't break the bank ordering these tests, and every once in a while, you'll be surprised when something comes up positive. And next, avoid prescribing medicine or recommending surgery unless you are very certain that there is a condition warranting either of those. And finally, if you're unsure, consider referral. I would suggest referral to a mental health professional and possibly to a specialist in whatever body system the patient is complaining of. Well, I hope this has been helpful, and as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.